So we'll press on. Um, thank you everyone to attend our quarterly market update webinar where Alex and myself will be looking at the economic backdrop, how different investment markets have been performing, and we'll also be looking at uh, the outlook in the year ahead. For those of you who attend these regularly, you will know Alex Brandreth, the Chief Investment Officer for Luna Investment Management, who coordinates the overall investment strategy for Luna. For those who don't attend regularly, um, an introduction to Alex, and a little bit too embarrassing. Um, Alex has appeared in the Citywire Top 100 Wealth Managers on numerous occasions, including, he's also been included in the inaugural Citywire Selector UK 30 Investment Managers, which showcases most influential fund selectors in the UK market today, and named in the 2019 Private Asset Management Top 40 Under 40. So thank you, Alex, for, uh, for coming to present today. No, thanks for Before we start the presentation, it's worth reiterating the importance of ensuring our clients have regular reviews and you take this up with your advisor to make sure that all of your plans are still on track to achieve any future goals and financial objectives. It's also essential that during the review, we review your risk and volatility to ensure your underlying funds reflect your risk appetite and also with volatility being um, is present across the markets at the moment, particularly over the last three years post-COVID and the various conflicts throughout the world that Alex will touch on. It's ensured to make sure that we review that um, and it's up to date. Before I pass you over to Alex, just a little bit of housekeeping. To mitigate any background noise, can we ensure that everyone's on mute? Um, the presentation is being recorded and will be available via our online YouTube channel. So moving into the 21st century. The webinar should last around 40 minutes and there'll be questions and answers at the end of the presentation. And this can be asked via the Q&A button just at the bottom, um, uh, bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So without further ado, I'd like to pass you over to Alex. Um, Alex will be looking at what's going on with the inflation and interest markets currently, a, a topic for most of our clients. How will this impact the investment markets and what is the outlook for the economy and the markets going forward? Over to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Stuart, and thank you for embarrassing me as well. It's always a pleasure. Um, morning, everyone. Thanks for your time today and for, for dialing in. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen now and go through uh, the, the agenda that Stuart mentioned. I think before before start, it, I mean, it it'd be amiss of me not to mention the ongoing conflict in in Israel and Palestine, and it's kind of, I think the first thing to say is, it's such a horrendous thing that's going on. Um, it, it it you know the humanitarian consequences are, are, are the are, are foremost in my mind. Um, we want a swift end to that, um, and sadly, it does have knock on impacts to markets as well. Um, Seen the oil price increase markedly over the summer months and, and more recently, and it just adds another potential wave of future inflation within the UK. And just as you thought we were starting to see inflation coming, well, we are seeing inflation coming down. It's it's another force that's going to be coming against it. And I'll, I'll touch on that as we're going through the uh, through the slides. Just to introduce Luna, um, uh, we, we're the largest independent discretionary manager um, in Manchester. We specialize in working with individuals, charities, trusts and companies, investment portfolios. We work with uh, individuals and financial advisors, such as Pareto. We can invest and manage portfolios across a multiple of wrappers, uh, whether it be pensions, a SIP, an ISO, an offshore bond, or family investment company, et cetera. It's amazing to think that three and a half years have gone, um, but that, that's where we are. Um, and the, Despite the fact that we've only been going for three and a half years, uh, we've all worked together uh, mostly uh, for a long period of time. And as you can see from, from here, there's a lot of grey hairs that we have within the team um, of over 200 years of experience of managing portfolios and different environments. Um, so you know, we've seen we've seen inflationary shocks um, within the team. We've seen bubbles. We've seen pandemics. We've seen recessions. We've seen political change. We've seen it all. Uh, and that experience matters when managing portfolios. And, you know, what, something that we're extremely proud of is being expert rated by de facto for, for two of our services, the bespoke portfolio service that we offer and our, our model portfolio service, which is only available by our advisors uh, on external platforms. 
So that's enough about us. Where are we? I'm going to concentrate on the UK first, and I'm going to talk, touch on what's going on with the global economy because it's just as important for the stock markets. On the left chart here, it, it shows GDP and it shows the different components that make up. So the different bars, stack bars, represent the different components that come through. The purple line represents well, what is actually going on with GDP. Um, so you can see here in green, that's that tends to be one of the biggest contributors to um to, to GDP, and that's consumption, as you can see down here. You can see the impact the government has on the investment, but consumption, because we're a service-led economy, has a has a big impact. This chart goes back to 2012. And you can see we were in for eight years, we were in a, a nice environment. The econo economy was growing quite nicely, uh, economic growth was positive. Uh, there was bits that were adding to it and detracting from GDP, but you know, overall the message was quite strong. And then you can see you just fell off a cliff. That's the pandemic in 2020 when it was the biggest quarterly fall in GDP ever. The economy reopens. The um, we all wanted to get back to our old lives and and go out and have go to restaurants, go on holidays, etc. And and um, economic growth really rebounded very strongly in 2021, 2022. And then what we've been going through over the last six months or so is is really that growth moderating to basically about zero. And you can see it's really come down. And, and one of the biggest negative contributors has been inventories. That's that blue bar, which has been which has been lagging. Uh, inventories because we did a lot of restocking. Um, we did a lot of restocking after the pandemic and because of supply side problems. And there was a lot of inventories being held. And that's that's been a negative contributor more recently. Now, GDP data is good, but it's always uh, announced with a bit of a delay. So we've just had the August GDP figures released um, recently, and that showed that the UK economy grew slightly in August. It also highlighted that the economy con contracted slightly in July. So it's always a bit of a delay because we're, we're talking about the summer and clearly we're in autumn. So on the right hand side, one of the measures that we look at is this composite PMI, Purchasing Manager Indices. And what they do is they look at what's going on in the economy right now, and they tend to lead uh, GDP data. So they're a really useful guide in terms of what's going on. And that's that purple line on the right hand side. This chart goes back slightly longer, back to 2000. And if, if it's above um, zero, then the economy is contracting. And if it's below, then the economy is, um, sorry, if it's above, then the economy is expanding. But if it's below, the economy is contracting. And if you go right to the end of that chart, you can see that that gray line has just dipped below uh, and highlights the economy slightly contracting at the moment. Now, it's not always perfect. You can see it, it did this a year or so ago. And the economy didn't go into recession then. So basically, the, the economic picture at the moment is it's quite muted growth. I mean, it, it seems to be talked about on a regular basis. Are we in recession? Are we not? We could technically be in recession, uh, but it's it's if it is, it's going to be a very shallow recession. And it's not going to be anything like we saw in the financial crisis or COVID at the moment. Economic growth is, is just stalling. So how does the UK fare on a global scale? So this is forecast for, for GDP growth this year and next year on the left hand side. And you can see that this is basically repeating the same picture for the UK. The UK is expected to have very modest growth this year, very modest growth next year. And that's pretty similar to Europe, but it has a slightly better picture within Europe. Um, but it's, it's, it's very similar that, you know, under 1% GDP growth is, is pretty weak. On the US, it's slightly better this year at 2%, but again, expecting to fall off. And on the right-hand side there, China. China's been the real disappointment this year. Um, I mentioned the playbook for when an economy comes out of COVID uh, restrictions. You start to see individuals getting back to their normal lives and enjoying experiences again. But GDP growth, despite it looking very strong there for China, has actually been pretty disappointing so far this year. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if those bars next time we present or the other way around because the the the, the, the uh, rebound comes next year because it really hasn't happened this year. And, and on the right hand side, it's back to those purchasing management indices that I mentioned earlier, and it's just got different nations on there. And the UK is not alone. Um, you can see that all economies move in tandem, really. Uh, the US, Europe and UK are all on there. You can see the lines are very correlated and you, you are seeing um, weaker PMI data coming out of the US and Europe as well as the UK at the moment. I think 
we put Europe on here, um, but it's important to look at Europe in different parts because it is such a big block. And there's definitely places within Europe that could arguably be said that are in recession at the moment. So Germany, clearly the biggest nation, is going through a pretty torrid time. And it's been interesting in the last few days that they're looking to expand the EU and they even mentioned about rearranging uh, Brexit deals. So perhaps Germany is really struggling and they're looking to expand Europe and, and get a better trade negotiations with the UK as one of their largest trading partners. Back to the UK, and this is inflation. So this chart goes back to 2021, so not too long, and it, it looks at the different components. There's another stack bar chart, the different components within, within inflation. You've got core services, which is that blue bar. On top of that, you've got goods. You've then got food and alcohol, which has been hitting headlines a lot recently because of the, the cost in shops. You've then got those grey bars on top, which is really what hurt last year. Uh, and inflation was already high, and then that came in and really catapulted it even higher. That's electricity and gas. Um, clearly, we know that situation's changed. And then you've got liquid fuels, which is petrol. So back to what I said at the beginning, you know, it, the oil price has picked up and you can see that how it has impacted um, inflation in the past. And when if, when the war really um, kicked out between U Ukraine and Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you can see it added about 1% uh, to inflation during 2022. Now, that has actually been a deflationary force. You can see that liquid fuels is below the line at the moment, and that's because the oil price is, is below the levels that it was a year or so ago. So that's actually acting as a deflationary force. And those grey bars have slowly, towards the end of that chart, have started to slowly reduce. And we know the reasons for that. Our electricity bills last year were a lot higher, and in this winter they're going to be a lot lower because the natural gas prices have adjusted lower. So as we sit here today, Inflation has been falling for, for almost a year. It's expected to continue to fall. Um, those electricity and gas will move to be a negative from next month. We've got inflationary data, which is out on Thursday, and it's predicted that it'll fall again on Thursday. The other forces that we've been seeing, services, core goods and food and alcohol, those impacts are also starting to moderate and are not increasing to the same extent. So. Hopefully, uh, there's some more good news to, to tackle with inflation. And as I said, it has been falling quite significantly for a year or so. But the reality of a higher inflationary environment is that the Bank of England the government have to respond and they have to react. And this is interest rates going back to 2002. So 20 odd years of data here. And we were in this environment between 2002, 2008, where we had, I'm going to say, normal interest rates. They weren't zero. They were in that kind of 4 to 6% range. Um, but then the financial crisis happened, and there was concerns about debt leverage uh, levels, and the Bank of England and other global central banks, one just the Bank of England, wanted to support their economy. And they kept interest rates very low for a very long period of time. And... Maybe that was the mistake that policymakers have had. We all got used to um, interest rates being being zero. Um, that impacted our mortgages. It may impacted the, amount, the, the, the debt levels that we took. It impacted how cheap finance was at the time as well. And it's been one hell of an increase. It's been the fastest increase in interest rates that we've ever seen. And that is starting to have consequences. Um, and one of the things that we get asked a lot at the moment is, you know, we get a, a significantly more attractive return from keeping money in the bank. And this kind of touches on that on the left-hand side. So the, the left-hand graph goes back to 22, and it's got two lines on it. You've got the interest earned on deposits compared to November 2021 and mortgage payments relative to 2021. And because interest rates are going up, the amount that we're getting in the bank has increased. So that line, that gray line has increased significantly. But as some of you may know, and you might come to find out in the coming years, that also has an impact on the mortgages uh, that we pay. And you can see gradually that it's been increasing. But there's a lot of focus on the negatives of interest rates going up. But this left-hand chart actually shows that this is a positive. You know, the amount that we've been earning um, from interest rates going up has been actually been a more of a positive to the economy at the moment, rather than negative, because we're all getting more interest. But on the, on the right-hand side, you know, that purple line will catch up and it looks at how um, percentage of mortgages are going to roll off over the next four or five years. And you can see when we get to 2027, nearly all more, well, all mortgages within the UK 
will be refinanced and they'll be refinanced in a higher rate. So that purple line is definitely going to be increasing over the coming years. So that's what's been going on with the economy. Um, basically, in summary, the economy is flatlining. Interest inflation is coming down. Um, but the Bank of England have had to respond and increase interest rates. I should have said, um, we probably think we're at the end of the interest rate hikes. So a lot of the pain has already happened, um, but that is going to, still going to be filtering through in the mortgage market over the coming years because of the delayed impact of fixed rate mortgages. So how have mark markets been performing against that backdrop? This just looks at the last quarter, where there's been a quarterly update. So it looks at July, August and September. You've got the major markets um, here. You've got the US, S&P 500, the FTSE All Share, the UK stock market. The yellow line is Japan. The green line is the, is the European equity market. We've put the NASDAQ in there, which is the technology index as well, which is light blue. That's been pretty volatile over the last two years. So we thought it was important to show that. And then you've got the Hang Seng on there as well, which is the Hong Kong stock market. So a proxy for what's going on in China. So in looking at the third quarter, the standout performer was the FTSE All Share. So it was the best performing market. The oil price increasing will have helped um, the major oil companies, BP and Shell, which are big constituents within there. So that's one of the reasons why the UK was a better stock market. You can see Europe was, was weaker. Um, again, some of the reflection that Germany might be in recession is starting to be to be felt. But you now a 2% fall within the quarter isn't a big move. Japan, um, Japan has been the best performing stock market this year, um, and it's given back some of those gains within the third quarter. And the US markets were, were also broadly positive in the quarter as well. Well, what about the bond market? So there's been a lot of attention within the bond market, rightly so, um, over the last two years, because the bond, bond markets have fallen more than equity markets. As interest rates have been increased, that's really impacted the, the required return that you want from bonds, and, and bond prices have fallen quite significantly. And I'll show some uh, on this slide in a second, just some evidence behind that. But just focusing on the third quarter again, that maroon line at the top is corporate bonds within the UK. So you're, you're buying bonds and getting a coupon from companies like I get the biggest companies in the UK. So Tesco's, for example, and Sainsbury's will be within that. The yellow line, that's strategic bonds. They have flexibility to go to, into different bond markets, different times. You've then got emerging markets and gilts at the bottom. So gilts are in that blue line. And you can see it's been a very volatile period. Um, initially, it was expected that interest rates would be increasing uh, last month and the Bank of England decided to pause. Um, and that's definitely had an impact on that blue line during the quarter. And then we've also put emerging market bonds, which we buy within portfolios, and they've been slightly weaker. And you can see they very much uh, relate to what's going on with the UK because it's also impacted by the US bond market as well. So in summary, it's been a better period for UK assets. The UK equity market has been the better performing stock market over the last quarter. UK corporate bonds have done slightly better. We haven't put US Treasury bonds on here, but they've had a very weak period, um, partly a reflection of the fact that there's been so much political issues within the US, um, whether it be the House of Representatives um, or the fact that there's a potential shutdown within the US that really impacted um, the US bond market uh, and maybe some future issues that the, the Federal Reserve are going to keep interest rates high for longer. So it has definitely been a better period to be in UK assets over the last quarter. But what about looking forward? Now, this chart shows the return that you can get on a 10 year UK government bond, and it goes back to 2018. And as I said, we started Luna in 2020. And the return that you could get every single year for 10 years back in 2020 for a UK government bond was, was under 0.5%. So every year, the client, our clients would receive 0.5% if we bought this, these bonds. And to us, that was a bit crazy because after fees and after inflation, we're almost guaranteed to, to lose people money, which is not what we're here to do. And then, as you can see, as interest rates have increased, um, that return that you can get on a 10-year UK government bond has increased markedly. So you can now get a return of around 5% from investing in UK government bonds. And this is all a function of the changing interest rate environment. So when we're building portfolios for clients, we, you know, as I said, our hands were tied in terms of more cautious assets back here because the return available was significantly less. 
But now that's completely changed. And if we think, if we're correct, and we're at the end of this interest rate environment, then that's that's that headwind and those losses that you've made from bonds goes away. Now, it's not just long-dated government bonds, because a 10-year government bond is quite long. This, this table looks at the return available from shorter-dated government bonds, and we've just put all the bonds in the market here. We've not tried to cherry-pick any at all. So the first one at the top matures in January 2024, and the bottom bond matures in October 2026. The next column looks on the coupon that's available on those bonds. That's fixed when you issue the bond. Now, because these bonds were all issued when interest rates are low, you can see that the coupons on all of them are fixed at very low rates. So because the coupon can't change and a bond is issued at a pound and matures sorry, 100 pound and matures at 100 pound, then the only thing that can change when interest rates uh, move is the price. And the price of bonds falls when interest rates go up and vice versa. If interest rates go down, the price of bonds goes up. And you can see that all of those bonds are below £100. And as I said, these bonds are going to mature at £100 when that comes, that maturity date comes. So that top bond there, when we get to the end of January 2024, it won't be at £98 anymore. It'll be £100. So there's two ways of making a return. You're going to get a return from the price increasing back to 100 but you're also going to get your coupon over that time period. But the coupon element is a very low part of the return because of the fact that much of them have very low coupons. So the return that you're gonna get is that gross redemption yield that combines the price recovering to 100 and the coupon. And as you can see, the gross redemption yield is pretty attractive across all these bonds. So you're getting them anywhere from four and up, four and a half to 5%. And we've just put the average there of 4.7. Now, one of the beautiful things about buying a government bond is the price recovering to 100 is completely tax-free. I'm going to say that again because it's a really important point. The price recovering to 100 pounds is completely tax-free. So if you take that bottom bond, for example, that's currently priced, priced at 88 spot 88. That's going to recover at maturity at 100 pounds. The only way it wouldn't mature is if the government defaults, and we definitely don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So that recovery is, is completely tax-free, as I mentioned. So what we've done on the right-hand columns here as well is, well, if you're getting money in the bank and you've put £100 in and you're getting, say, a 5% um, return on a cash account, well, that is taxed. That's taxed at your marginal tax rate, whether that be 20 40 45%. So the return on bonds is mostly tax-free, as I said. So to get the same return from a cash deposit, as you do on a government bond, and you're a 45% tax rate, you need to be getting a 7% return on your cash if you go into the bank. That's the only way you can get the same return. And there's not that many bank accounts out there that get 7%. And we're getting a lot of questions at the moment about cash. And if you are more cautious and you've been invested and you're not comfortable with that, then we fully understand. But um, what my point is, there's, there's, there's attractive, low-risk products out there, a government bond, a UK government bond, which can get you more attractive returns, and you don't have to take a lot of maturity risk for that. And let's say we fast forward two years and interest rates are lower, and and government bonds have improved in price, and you, but then you're not going to be getting the same return that you will be in the, with the bank as well. This gives you the flexibility to look at different investment options as and when they become available. It's not just government bonds that we're finding attractive, though, at the moment. This looks at the whole of the different bonds that we can invest in. We've got the government bonds from different countries on the left-hand side. Japan stands out because they haven't increased interest rates, and that's why they, it's still low. You've got investment grade corporate bonds um, in those gray bars. You've got convertible bonds, high yield bonds, and emerging market bonds. The diamond represents the return, the yield that you were getting at the start of 2022. So before these increase in interest rates, the bar represents what the return you can get on these bonds today. And then the, the right hand blue chart just highlights what we've already mentioned about the UK. You were getting a 1% return at the beginning of last year. Today, you're getting a much more attractive return. With the nature of markets, though, if you're willing to take a bit more risk, 
then you should be rewarded and receive higher return. And that's why the, the gray bars are higher than the blue bars, because if you're buying or buying and bonds from corporates, there's a higher risk of default um, from those, those companies going bust compared to the UK government. And therefore you should be expected to get a higher return. So the return on that very right-hand gray bar at the moment is close to 7%. So for buying a UK corporate bond, which is credit rating of, of triple B, you can get a 7% return. If you're willing to take a bit more risk, you can buy a global high yield fund and get a return of nearly 9%. So when we're sitting here today and we're constructing portfolios, we're finding value in government bonds for more cautious portfolios. For clients willing to take a little bit more risk, we're finding more attractive returns going forward for corporate bonds and high yield bonds. And you can see their emerging market bonds. So the outlook and the future returns available for investors in the bond market are significantly more attractive because of the moving interest rates that we've had. Now, another question that we're getting is, you know, should we be having invested in cash or should we be investing in bonds? And this chart looks at the gray line, which is the US Federal Reserve interest rate. And it goes all the way back to the mid 80s. And you can see how interest rates have changed over time. So if you go back to the late 80s, early 90s, interest rates were a lot higher. And then interest rates were cut. You've got the tech bubble in there. You've then got the financial crisis when interest rates were cut in 2008, back to zero. You've got the period where interest rates were increased um, after in the US particularly. And then you've got this situation where we are today. And you can see here that interest rates have increased in the US as well as we've highlighted in the UK, but it is expected that they're going to start to fall. What the blue bar looks at is, well, what was the return of bonds versus cash? So if the bar is above zero, then bonds have outperformed cash. And this looks at when interest rates have peaked. So if interest rate, if we're correct, and interest rates have peaked in the UK and US, there's one, two, three, four, five situations here when that's happened over the last 30 years. And in all of those situations, bonds have delivered better returns than, than cash. And there's reasons for that because central banks, there's always a delay from increasing interest rates to when it's actually being felt. And we've mentioned that with the mortgage market within the UK, there's a delayed impact. And we haven't felt the full consequences of interest rates being increased. So what central banks do is they, they go too much uh, increase interest rates too much one side and then they cut them too much on the other side because they're not, not sure the full impact it's going to be. And that's what we've seen over and over over the years. So when central banks have increased interest rates so much, you can see they've then reduced them very quickly as well. And as I said right at the beginning, if interest rates fall, then that means that bond prices will in, increase. So bonds outperform cash in that environment. That's the bond market. It's not very often we spend so much time talking about the bond market, but it's really important at the moment. It's really important because you're getting attractive returns better than cash. Um, history has shown us that if interest rates do come down in the future, then you'll also deliver better returns than cash in that environment as well. So for us, yes, you get certainty from investing in cash, but the return potential, if you're willing to take a slightly longer view, slightly willing to take a little bit more risk, historically has rewarded you in terms of returns. So what about the equity market then? And this looks at the global forward PE ratios. So how cheap or how expensive are companies at the moment? And if the bars at the top, um, that means that markets are quite expensive. The bars at the bottom, it means that markets are quite cheap. And this looks at the range since 1990, that, that, black, that gray bar. We've then got the average since 1990, and then you've got the current, uh, which is the green line, sorry, and then you've got the current value of markets, which is that blue diamond. And you can see on the right-hand side, all of those markets are below the average, which means you're buying the market very cheap. On the flip side, the US stands out to us as a market that's quite expensive. Um, you can see that blue diamond is above the gray, green line. But that being said, it's not near the top of that line. So it's slightly more expensive than the average, but not, not significantly more expensive. And one of the reasons why the US to us is, is expensive is the top 10. I'm going to be talking about the top 10 in quite a lot of detail now. The top 10 companies in the US account for 30% of the S&P 500. So it really matters what the valuation is on those companies. And this chart here just separates the top 10 
versus the other 490 companies in the S&P 500. It goes back to 1996. The green line is the top 10. And you can see it right at the beginning of that chart, as we moved into the tech bubble, the US market performed very strongly. We went from a PE of 20 times to over 40 times. The market got very expensive. Then what happened is company valuations were too expensive. Um, there was too much euphoria in the market. Everyone was putting .com at the end of their name and markets, the bubble burst, the tech bubble burst and the and stock, stock prices fell. And that line came down and it was, when you look at around the financial crisis, it was at 10 times. So it was very cheap to buy the US market. And the top 10 companies at that stage were pretty much same valued as the other 490 companies. But what we've been going through over the last 10 years is, is tech has really dominated and those company valuations have re-rated significantly. And those companies have become more and more expensive. And that was then um, extended as we went into COVID because well, we couldn't do anything. We were all on Zoom. Um, we were all reliant on Microsoft products. We were all ordering things online with Amazon. Now our lives completely changed during the pandemic and it pushed valuations of those businesses even higher again. And last year, that really came out, that slowly came out of the valuation and those company share prices fell. But this year, we're now going for another wave of euphoria with regards to artificial intelligence. And you can see that line's popped back up again to be very expensive levels. And this is important because we've been reducing our exposure to the S&P 500 because those 10 companies represent 30% of the market. But we still like the US. So we've been buying that gray line because that gray line is more appropriately valued. And I'll, I'll explain why in, in a second, why it's really important to concentrate when you what price you're paying for something. Now, I'll just take a look at these top 10. Apple is the biggest company in the world. That PE ratio on that is at 30 times. So the earnings, the price that you're paying for Apple today is 30 times the earnings that you gain. Microsoft 34, and then you get into some scary territory of Amazon and NVIDIA. NVIDIA has been uh, seen as, as the AI uh, leader at the moment because they're the company that manufactures the chips. That's over 100 times. Now, the reason that's so high is because they're bringing forward the future profits that they believe NVIDIA will generate in the future and bringing it back to today's valuation. Facebook, which is Meta's on there at 38 times, Tesla at 74 times. It's incredibly expensive. And Eli Lilly um, has been performing well this year because there's another, as well as the artificial intelligence, everyone's been talking about these weight loss drugs which are coming through within the UK and in, in the US. And Eli Lilly's um, a particular uh, player in that market. And just want to zoom in and just look at Apple. I think this is staggering, this chart. So the value of Apple, looking at all the shares that are an issue and multiplying it by that share price, gets you the market capitalization. How big is Apple? Apple is $2.7 trillion. That is bigger than every single company listed in the UK. 595 com companies at 2.6 trillion in the UK. And I'm slight, I'm not, I didn't want to show my home bias by putting the UK on there. So we just put some other European markets on there. So as I said, if you go back to that chart here, Apple's on 30 times. And you can see that's at very expensive levels. We think Apple's a wonderful company. Don't be wrong. We've got two Apple phones. But I'm just saying a lot of good news is within the price of the Apple share price at this stage. And as I said, what matters when you're buying something is the price that you pay at something. And if you're buying something that's slightly expensive, which we've highlighted, I hope we highlight, have highlighted that that's the case within the US, then that impacts the future returns that you get. So this chart looks at if you had bought the market at a, say, let's say a 10 times P ratio, or you bought the market at a 24 times P ratio, the return that you got for, for the next 10 years. So it looks at where you were and where, you, where you're going to go. And the green line represents where we are today. So we're not, as I said, we're not at the screamingly high valuation levels that we were at the top of the tech bubble. That was really when market returns were here and the next 10 returns were pretty weak in terms of performance. But equally, we're not down here. We're not as at 10 times in terms of a PE ratio. So we're not, you know, the forward looking returns aren't going to be as high because the, you're just not buying in at a cheap valuation point. But where are you buying in a cheap valuation point? And this goes back to those bar charts I said before in the UK. So this looks at the UK FTSE All Share, goes back to 2000, 
Um, the grey line represents how the P ratio has changed and the, the green line, the green dotted line represents the average um, over this time period. And if you go right to the beginning of the chart, again, the UK was very similar to the US and there was a lot of euphoria within the market, particularly companies like Vodafone at the time. Um, and the market as a whole was pretty expensive. Um, and what happened is the market gradually derated and that line fell. So it means company share prices just fell between 2000 and they really bottomed out of the, uh, during, the te uh, during the global financial crisis in 2008 because there was so much fear around at the time about big banks failing. But from 2008 to, to to, to here, 2016, you can see that the market recovered and we were slightly more expensive. Then Brexit came along, brilliant Brexit, and the market then derated very quickly. And you can see that the people's um, enthusiasm to invest in the UK was, was hit. Uh, and I say the UK, but the UK stock market is not the UK economy. Within the UK FTSE All Share, 30% of the earnings within the UK FTSE All Share come from inside the UK, but 70% come from outside the UK. So that's why it matters so much to us what's going on on a global scale, not just what's going on with the UK economy. And then what's happened at more recently, you can see that lines continue to drift lower. We hit a low at the end of September last year when everyone was worried about inflation, everyone was worried about winter coming, European uh, recession, gas prices were high, and it re really impacted sentiment within the UK. And then gradually since then, the, the market's recovering, but you can see it's still trading at a significant discount to where, where the green line is. So the UK P ratio is at 10, where the average is at 14. So there's a big discount. And if we just go back to this chart and we say, well, we're buying something at 10 times, and this is for the US market, so it's probably not a perfect guy, but you can see what happens, the future 10 returns, when you're buying in a market, which is very cheap and has a lot of bad news priced in. And it's been pretty unfashionable to be saying this now for for a year or two because everyone wants to talk about artificial intelligence. No one wants to talk about how cheap companies like BP, Shell, AstraZeneca, Unilever, uh, Tesco, etc., are. But but they are because the UK has not been a loved market. Now that that's very short term. Um, just want to zoom out and just think about well, what are the long term returns that you get from investing in markets? And this is it's important again. This is the longest term chart that I can find. It goes back to 1900. Just looks at UK assets. So the return that you can get on UK bonds, the return you can get on UK equities, and the return you can get in UK cash. And again, one of the questions we're getting at the moment is, well, why invest? You know, cash, you can get 6% in the bank and it's guaranteed. Well, over the long term, cash has not been a great investment uh, to have. And you can see here, um, on the, in this in this table in the top here, the long term returns from cash are about 0.6 percent. This is a real return, so after inflation, and in this period where interest rates have been so low for such a long period of time, it was actually a negative to hold cash, and that's something we've been saying to clients about for a long period of time. But on the flip side, both equities and bonds have delivered over the long term real returns, so returns above that of inflation. And that's because companies are real assets. Companies can increase prices. Companies can maintain margins um, you know, to, in this environment of higher inflation. And even over the last 22 years, when we've had um, inflation, which has been more subdued, you've been delivered real returns from investing in these asset classes as well. No one can time the market. No one can tell you when it's the top. No one can tell you when it's the bottom. Just it's fact. If they did, they'd be trading in and out all the time and they'd be sat on a beach in Barbados or somewhere like that. Um, but no one can time the market. So so what we and we're the same. We we acknowledge that we can't do that. We do drift in and out of asset classes. So you know, we've been taking profits from the US and we've been adding to areas like the UK and Japan this year because we see that that's where the opportunities are. And this just looks at why why you shouldn't try and time the market. This looks at the FTSE all share. Left hand bar chart. If you'd been invested for the last 15 years and you just stayed invested, you would have got a return of 6.1%. But if you'd missed the best 10 days during that 15 year period, just 10 days in 15 years, your return goes down to 1.6. And that's often because the best days is when you really don't feel like it's going to be, it's when it's really uncomfortable. 
The best day in 2020 was when Boris Johnson announced that we've been going into lockdown. Uh, who would have thought that would have been in the case? One of the best days was when the Pfizer vaccine was announced in 2020 as well. Who knew when that date was going to be? You never know when it's going to happen. And that's why it's so difficult to time markets, because you, you don't know when these events are going to happen. We're still in a national lockdown at that stage. But what happens if you miss the next 20 days? Well, you actually lose money. And you can see that just gets worse. So if you miss the best 40 days, you actually go from making 6% to losing 5%. Trying to time the market is very difficult. And as I said, going back to this chart here, there's opportunities at the moment. I know it's been a very difficult period to be invested, but there's opportunities looking forward to be invested in selective equity markets. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm conscious of uh, some questions. Just want to just quickly give a quick summary, though, of what I've said um, in terms of markets. There's opportunities if you want to have safe um, investments and you don't want to take a lot of risk. There's opportunities with short dated gilts and there's tax benefits to that. If you're willing to take a little bit more risk, then there's opportunities within longer dated gilts. There's opportunities within corporate bonds and high yield. And from an equity market perspective, you're not buying in, in the UK's instance, at a very cheap level. And to us, that's there's opportunities within the UK market to deliver strong returns. So as we sit here today, we're very optimistic about the next five or 10 years. I don't know what's going to happen over the next three or six months. No one does. Um, who knows how political events and events will happen and things will escalate. But if you sit back and you take a longer term horizon, which is what we do, when we're picking funds, when we're speaking to fund managers and companies, then the return potential from this starting point today is very attractive. Stuart, there's a couple of questions that have jumped into the uh, into the Q and A box there. Um, just want, do you want to hope? Do you want to go through them? Yeah, of course. So there's a couple of questions that you said, Alex. Um, the first one, by increasing exposure to the bond markets, which I know you you, you concentrated on, you gave me some great insight. Where would you expect to see the shift back towards equity? So clients do go into the bond market, or if you're overexposed to the bond market, where would you expect to see the shift back to equities? Um, well, as, I mean, as I said, we, we haven't really shifted out of equities. We've been shifting out of alternatives that have disappointed more so. So we back in 2020, we were building portfolios that needed to be defensive clients, but we couldn't do that with bonds for the reasons I mentioned. So we're in alternatives. And so it's not really been a reduction in equities that's come through. Bizarrely, equities, it's not really bizarre because the equity market moves ahead of the economy about six to nine months. So if we're sitting today, what the market's thinking, it's thinking at the middle of next year now. So the equity market is cheap, which is almost suggesting that it's kind of predicting that the UK might be in recession next year. So that's already been factored into equity markets to a certain extent. And equity markets perform their best when economies are in recession, because when it, it's then looking forward to when's the economy coming out of recession, because it will do at some point, everything's cyclical, um, and equity markets recover in that environment. So the best time to be invested in equities is when you're in recession. Um, we're not in recession at the moment, and I don't know if we're going to have, as I said, we might have a mild recession, but a lot of that bad news has already been priced into stock markets already. Okay, good, thank you. Um, another one just following on from, from, from that question, I suppose. Are, guilt, are the guilts that were mentioned suitable for a SIP or a more at tax base to hold individually? Um, both, I suppose. So, I mean, the, so a SIP, you don't get the tax benefits um, that are mentioned in terms of capital gains tax because of the recovery in price. Um, but holding guilts is still a good strategy for a diversified portfolio. For the reasons I mentioned, if interest rates do come down, then gilt prices will recover in value. And that's why gilts have outperformed in those five instances relative to cash, because interest rates come down and gilts deliver you a, a better return. That example was based on the US, but it's exactly the same for, for the UK. And as I said, if we're building a diversified portfolio today, we're getting 5% return on safe haven like government bonds. You've got potential return i mean the equity market's done eight percent over the long term and we're slightly cheaper than that so maybe let's say that's ten percent return you can build a very well diversified portfolio and get pretty attractive returns from the starting point today um i suppose the other thing i mentioned about gilts is they offer diversification in portfolio 
So what was if we're wrong about the UK equity market and we do go into a very severe recession, uh, the equity market will fall in that situation. But if the UK is in recession, inflation will collapse. The Bank of England will cut interest rates and that'll be a good, uh, bonds will increase in value in that. So having bonds does provide good diversification within portfolios. And just one final point, it, all of this, and this is what Stuart and the guys are great to do more, more so than anything, all of this depends on your attitude to risk. Your attitude to risk is the most important point here, because if you're a very adventurous client, you probably don't want to buy government bonds. But if you're very cautious and you're very nervous, then buying government bonds is a very safe and sound investment strategy, particularly at this point in time. Okay, good. Thanks, Alex. I mean, Alex, one of the questions that I'm getting asked quite a lot from my clients is the reverting back to you're able to get five, six percent sat in cash, depending if it's instant access or or a one year fixed term. Um, what I'm seeing, we saw at the, the, the beginning of the week with the NSNI pulling their 6.2% 12 month fixed rate bond. We're seeing two year deposit rates and three year deposit rates actually coming down. Yeah. So, and a lot of clients who have had poor performance over the last 18 months, three years, are saying, why don't they just revert to cash? And one of the things that we're saying is, well, the, the, the cash rate at the moment is only temporary. And if you come out of equities, you might get 6% in cash for one year, but when do you start going back in to the equity market? And will that be higher? So in terms of clients, particularly with income, what would you be su suggesting they should be looking for? Because they have had a hit in their investments over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, I think, again, it all depends on personal circumstances. That's the most important today. Is cash required over the next year or so to, to, for any reason? And that's the most important question to start with. Then if the cash isn't needed, as I said, uh, and this is this is the difficult environment in that we've been in an environment for 15 years where interest rates are low and we were forced to move our cash to make it work because we we, we weren't getting a return on, on, on cash. Because, and in fact, you're getting a negative return because of inter inflation being above that of the interest rate. Situation is different now, um, but in cash impacts all other asset classes as well. As I said, you can get higher returns now than we have done over the last 15 years on guilt or corporate bonds. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's been painful going through that. But if we think that we're at the end of it and interest rates have stopped, then now's not the time to be thinking about selling these assets, in my view. If interest rates carry on going up, then you know there could be further pain to come, but that's not the central scenario that we have here. Um, so the returns available going forward are more attractive because cash is higher. You know, cash is the lowest risk asset, and then you've got government bonds and you have corporate bonds. So cash going up has repriced all the other um all those other bars as I highlighted earlier. So the return available, return available going forward is a lot more attractive. And back to what I said on equity markets, you can still get attractive dividends and returns from investing in, in investing in equities at this stage, particularly the UK. The UK is a higher yielding market than say the US, which has got more technology dominated, and they tend to pay lower dividends. So again, it's if you are looking for a steady stream of income, then, then the bonds are attractive. Companies are attractive as well because they work in the real world. So they'll be increasing dividends, hopefully above inflation. And that's what we look for with the companies that we're, we're picking and the funds that we select within income space is that companies can consistently uh, increase their dividend above that inflation. And that means that gradually we get wealthier over time as well. I mean, the only thing I would add to that is going back to what we said at the start of the webinar, it's important to remember what you're investing for, what are your objectives, Yeah. what is your long-term plan, and don't let short-term influences affect those long-term plans going back to your slide. If you miss the, the best 10 days of the market, or the 20 days, you actually become into a negative return scenario. Yeah. Um, Another good question that's just come through. So, realistically, when should we expect inflation to come down? And what will be the biggest driver? If I, if I can just add something there, Alex, I also think it's important to remember post 2008, we've had a generation of probably false low inflation, low returns on bank deposits. And that's the anomaly. It's not that that shouldn't be the norm. 
think interest rates and inflation have been that low for so long. But why would you expect inflation to come down? And what would be the biggest driver of this? Yes, uh, great question. So I think you're right in terms of you know, this, you should, you shouldn't, money shouldn't be free. I mean, that's not healthy. Um, and that's the environment that we're in. And we, our view is that you know, interest rates will come down at some point in the future because we'll have a recession and Bank of England will want to keep in, in interest rates low in that situation. But they're not going back to zero. So we need to get used to this kind of three to five and a half percent world that we're in now. And that's a more normal world in terms of interest rates. Back to the question on inflation, though. Uh, but it's already fallen. It's been falling for a year. Uh, you know, we're, it's amazing if you go back a year ago, we had inflation at over 10, 11% at the time. Um, and today we're kind of 6.8 CPI is today. It's, we've got an inflation print out on Thursday. The expectation is it goes down to 6.7. Um, Rishi came out and said when he came to prime minister that he wanted inflation to half. Probably will do that, to be fair. It's not going to be anything to do with him, um, but it'll be due to what's been going on with the market. Um, so it is expected that you get UK inflation down to kind of 4 or 5% by the end of the year. So it is falling very quickly. It's still well above the Bank of England target of 2%, which would be causing them more comfortable um, conversations at the Bank of England, but it's it's not at the 10 11% level that we were a year, a year ago. Um, I think it'll continue to fall next year. The... the the risk now, though, is is the longer term impact of inflation. So, and there's, there's a couple of reasons which making me a bit nervous on longer term inflation. I think inflation might be big longer over, uh, bigger over the longer term. And one of that is because the first wave was all to do with prices, commodity prices, and because everyone was feeling a bit poorer, we all turned around and told our employees we want more money. Uh, so that's that's inflationary. Um, we've got this geopolitical risk at the moment with regard to the oil price, and that's inflationary. Um, and then the, the big driver and the big deflationary driver that we had in the 90s and the 2000s and 2010s was China. China was used as the producer of last resort. Everyone was moving in operations to China. We were importing cheap goods from China. And now that feels that kind of globalization trend is starting to reverse. We're kind of going to deglobalization. And I think that's structurally going to be higher inflation as well. And then not to mention the fact that we want to transition our whole energy um, dependence over the next 10, 20 years. And that means investing a lot of money to, to get more solar power plants, to get some more wind farms, et cetera, to become more green. And that means that government's going to have to spend more money and that's inflationary as well. So for that reason, I think we're just going to be in this structurally higher inflationary environment. And that's why I don't think rates will, will go back down to the low levels that we saw after the financial crisis. So just following on from that political comment, and I know this is there's a couple of questions that have come in. One strictly political in terms of what do you think the impact will be if Labour get into government in the next general election? And secondly, crystal ball time, when can we expect the next bull market? Fingers crossed in brackets when the uh when they attend the of the election. So I think the what first point would like to be with Labour and secondly, when do we when can we expect the next bull market? So uh, with regard to political developments, um, there's very few times that political events really impact markets, um, but they can impact individual sectors if they decide to do specific changes. And it doesn't really necessarily need to have a political change to be able to have that happen as well. So I don't know if you saw the announcement a month or two ago that the Conservatives were reviewing the veterinary services companies because of the pricing model and what's happened since, since the pandemic. And some of the largest um, companies in the in the stock market, the UK stock market, really, really suffered on the back of that. And you've seen it in the past when they go after individual subsidies or um, grants on, on energy companies as well. So I don't think it will have a massive impact on the market as a whole. And you could argue that the reason the UK is so cheap is because of all the political mess that we've gone through over the last seven years as well. So I think that's already had an impact and left UK companies cheap. It's left sterling cheap as well. Um, but yeah, the stock market won't really be impacted by it. I think whoever, whichever party comes in, their hands are tied. And it's really sad to say that because we're too indebted. You can't start the fiscal taps running um, to try and support the economy because we tried to do that in a mini budget last year and that ended in disaster. Um, 
So there's not really a lot that the government can do. Um, my biggest concern is around inheritance tax and the scrapping of that because we manage an aim portfolio uh, selfishly. And that's what the Conservatives um, are talking about, scrapping, and that could have a really big impact on, on those companies. And to be honest, it already has. AIM has been a really tough place to invest this year because, because of, uh, people are concerned about that. So in summary, who knows? We're not, we need to find out more detail about what Labour policies will be, what Conservative policies will be. We need to see how the Scottish people vote as well, uh, Stuart, because uh, I think that's going to be the swing factor for the election next year. And, you know, whether the SNP, um, how many seats they lose to Labour, because I think that will be, that's going to be critical. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's something to be monitored. And, and let's see what policies they come out with and what type of sectors they start to, to impact. When does the next bull market start? Um, the, the, uh, I think it probably started at September last year. So the end of September last year was when markets uh, bottomed out globally. Um, and since the last year, the markets has delivered quite decent returns, um, whisper it quietly. It doesn't feel like it because the beginning of 2022 was so bad um, and the bond markets have been impacted more so than the equity market. But if you go, I'm just going to reshare my screen. I just want to share one slide. And it, because I didn't mention it before, let's see if we can get back. Come on, where are we going, Alex? Come on, keep going. This one. So there's one, two, three, four um, times when that chart, uh, that line has been at its low. This is the financial crisis. Markets were very cheap. A lot of bad news have been priced into it. We went on one hell of a bull market. European debt crisis. People were really concerned about Greece at the time and, and that forced valuations cheaper. We went on to, excuse me, have a very strong bull market. COVID, perfect time to invest because everyone was fearful. And the market's actually cheaper now than it was when we were in COVID. But that's that. That's the um, 30th of September that I mentioned last year, maybe when the low in the market was. This is just the UK. Um, and the market has recovered and that's why that line's got up. So it's not as cheap as what it was. But certainly markets have recovered and, and aren't as uh, cheap as what they were. So, yeah, maybe we've already had it. Yeah, good, thanks. Well, Alex, thank you. I think it's safe to say it's been a tough couple of years, maybe three years with regards to investment markets in the economy. I mean, you just mentioned something then, Alex, um, and there's a great, great quote by Warren Buffet in terms of, being greedy when others are being fearful and fearful when others are being greedy and maybe at this moment in time when people are being fearful is it time to get in the market and take advantage of the volatility and the market movements that you've uh, been discussing today um i'd like to thank everyone for the time today dial again alex as always for presenting the next quarterly investment seminar will be in january 2024 um, so I don't want to sit here and wish everyone a happy Christmas and happy New Year's. So I won't, um, but the Christmas markets are starting in a couple of weeks. So maybe it isn't too early just yet to um, wish people that. I would stress the fact that it's worth speaking to your advisors and reviewing your plans, reviewing your risk profile, reviewing your risk volatility to make sure that your plans are still there to meet your financial objectives in the long term. Um, again, feel free to for myself or your advisor up at Pareto if we can help where possible. And again, I'd just like to thank everyone for dialing in. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.